Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, one of my responsibilities at this museum is to manage our ongoing oral history project. This is an ongoing initiative which has captured over 1,100 stories from people all over the world about their memories of President Kennedy, the assassination, the impact the assassination had on their lives, and the history and culture of the 1960s. And every so often in doing this project, uh, we find a remarkable storyteller, and we like to invite those guests back to the museum to share their story in front of an audience, and that's what living history is all about. And uh, you're in for a real treat today. We have a very special guest joining us today, a true legend in journalism. Uh, Walter Mears, uh, in a career that spanned over four decades with the Associated Press, covered every presidential election, 1960 to the year 2000. And he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977, Pulitzer Prize in uh, National Reporting, uh, for his coverage of the 1976 presidential campaign. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to talk a little bit about his career, a, lo a lot about his memories of President Kennedy in the day of the assassination. And we want to hear from you as well. So you should have gotten question cards when you walked in today. If you'll fill those out as we're talking today, we'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible. Later on in the program, I will ask you to pass those to the end of your rows. We'll quickly collect those and try to go through as many as we can. But uh, right now, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Walter Mears to share his story with us today. Walter, let's go way back to the very beginning. You joined the AP in 1955, and you started off just answering phones and, and doing some stories in the office, right? Well, I like to say that I went from my mother to the Associated Press. I graduated <laughs> from college in 1956, but I actually started in the Boston Bureau the summer before that in 1955, and the day after I graduated from Middlebury College in Vermont, I reported for work at the AP in Boston and never looked back. And you got to know John F. Kennedy by working at the Boston Bureau, right? My first exposure to Kennedy was you know, as senator from Massachusetts, uh, and uh, later as his career climbed, uh, I was sent to cover him. Uh, Basically, as a helper, I was a rather young and junior staffer in the whole process um, when he would go to Hyannisport for, for uh, weekends. But that started the process. I traveled a little with him and uh, then got my first extended tour of national political reporting uh, with Richard Nixon that fall because one of the real guys in Washington got sick and could, couldn't make the trip. <laughs> and that's, that's how it all started for you, your first presidential election. <clears throat> Take us back to, to those early years. We remember Kennedy today, almost half a century after his death, through uh, Life magazine, through black and white news footage. Give us a sense of the real John F. Kennedy, the man that you encountered. As best I can, as I say, I wasn't covering the White House. I was not in the senior staff level that would have given me constant exposure to that. One thing that, uh, that uh, uh, has become myth is the whole Camelot legend. I mean, if you talk to younger people now, they think everybody in Washington walked around humming Camelot during that. <laughs> <laughs> that whole uh, image did not exist until after Kennedy was dead. It grew from an interview that, uh, that uh, uh, Theodore White, the great uh, chronicler of politics, uh, did with Jackie Kennedy, who mentioned that Kennedy liked to listen to the soundtrack of Camelot late at night. And so Kennedy's Washington became Camelot after he was gone. Um, he was uh, uh, he was a very, uh, for a politician, a very graceful figure in stark contrast to Lyndon Johnson, who was a very earthy, you know, uh, um, uh, from, the, from the ground up figure. Kennedy was, uh, Kennedy was a man of charm and grace and also some removal from the everyday world in a, that most of us live in because he was a very rich man. He had a very pampered upbringing. You know, his father was his chief promoter, uh, and uh, 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 they say the rich are different from you and I. He certainly was. 
let's take that one step further. Give us a characterization of Kennedy versus Nixon. What were those two men like? Uh, Kennedy was a very skilled politician. Um, I, I once wrote about an episode during that tour I had with Nixon when I was uh, doing my first national political coverage that fall. Uh, Nixon was staying at the Waldorf Towers and they were probably nothing like the mob scene that covers presidents now. There were probably 15 or 20 of us uh, uh, waiting in the lobby of the Waldorf while Nixon was upstairs and before he went to his next stop. All of a sudden John Kennedy walked in, came over to us, said hello, called everybody by name, including me, which I found very flattering. And he, you know, there was no entourage, there was no television, there were no satellite, well satellite dishes hadn't been invented. <laughs> but I mean it just wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said I just came down to get my hair cut because uh, he liked the barber at the Waldorf. He always stayed at the Carlisle way uptown. Uh, and uh, um, he chatted for six, eight minutes with the political reporters who were covering his opponent, saying things like, wow, good to see you guys, how am I doing, stuff like that. Nixon could not have done that. Nixon couldn't, wouldn't uh, interact. Nixon particularly disliked reporters at that time. Uh, and uh, um, so when I was traveling with Nixon, I was, because of the AP's position on the press, on the, on the candidate's plane, I was always on Nixon's plane, which was an old Lockheed propeller driven plane, and we would get on, and, and Mr. and Mrs. Nixon would be seated right by the entrance that the traveling six reporters who were in the press pool uh, went past, and they would sit there rigid, it was as though the reporters didn't exist and they would we would file to the back of the plane and then they'd come back to life after that campaign nixon said reporters liked kennedy better than they liked me and you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> i came to know nixon fairly well later and and uh, you know had conversations with him and and you know found him to actually be a human being inside there uh, if, as we found out, a very flawed one. But in that 1960 campaign, he was, he was rigid and uptight, convinced that he was, his resume, his record, he was vice president, he was nationally known, and who was this kid from Massachusetts um, who was gonna carry him, and uh, which led to what I think, uh, in hindsight, he saw as his greatest mistake, which was to agree to the presidential debates. Well, let, let's talk about that. Television obviously played a very decisive role in that election. Uh, what was your assessment then and, and today? Well, it was a different kind of television. I mean, the debates were, you know, like a, a that was a studio show. That was all set up. That was, but it did, and Kennedy marveled at it later when talking with some reporters as he liked to, just, he'd have his tomato soup and then come back and chat in, the, in his plane. So, you know, marveling that the millions of people who had just watched him two days before on, on that debate with Nixon and saying, how long would it take me to go and meet those people, you know, this way, the old fashioned way, because that's how campaigns still were run. You went from city to city, from rally to rally, you shook hands, you said hello, you kissed babies, all of that stuff. Um, he didn't put on funny hats because Kennedy said he was never going to be photographed wearing a funny hat like the one he saw Calvin Coolidge in. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, television was decisive for the debates, I think. I don't think, uh, I, I don't know that Kennedy would have won without the debates. But it was not integral to the coverage of the campaign because it couldn't be. I mean, those were 16 millimeter movie cameras with huge tripods and sound and light and everything else. Television couldn't cover anything it hadn't set up for. The, the action was with the print press in those long gone days, which I dearly miss. <laughs> Nixon vowed in the 1960 campaign that he would visit all, sta all, 50, all states, 50 states. And, and we never saw this sort of thing happen again after 1960. Well, everybody learned their lesson from Nixon, including Nixon. <laughs> 
Um, late in the campaign, having damaged his knee in an accident, looking as sick as he looked on television that first debate, <clears throat> and, you know, traveling in those days was, you know, flights to Alaska were not uh, quick hits. They still aren't, but nothing like it was then. He went to Alaska the last week of the campaign because that was the 50th state and the one he hadn't made it to. Well, he, you know, there were three electoral votes which he had absolutely locked up. There was no way he could lose Alaska. He lost two and a half to three days of campaign time flying to Alaska to keep that pledge. I, I think that taught him two things. Don't promise to go to all 50 states and never keep your pledges. <laughs> <laughs> Your career is, is bookended by two of the closest races in American history, 1960 and, and 2000. Um, take us back to election night, 1960. That was a real nail biter. Were you up all night? I was at the time. In 1960, I was, in, I was, uh, I was still in New England. Uh, and I had been sent, I was the correspondent in Vermont until shortly before that election. And I had been sent back up there to cover the election in Vermont. So I wasn't involved in the national coverage. So I was like everybody else watching on television as uh, the early Kennedy landslide. Then suddenly uh, the networks, which were using uh, sampling and all that stuff for the first time, discovered that they were using it wrong and that no, it wasn't going to be a landslide, and all of a sudden that went on all night. The AP did not declare Kennedy to have been elected president until two days later right. uh, when he carried uh, uh, Minnesota. The UPI uh, beat us on that by a day and a half by being wrong. They said that, uh, that uh, uh, Kennedy had won California, which he hadn't, but they got the right answer with the wrong information. <laughs> In your career, you've obviously covered candidates and presidents who've been mired in scandal and controversy. Kennedy escaped that. Everything we know now about Kennedy uh, came out after his death. Was there a code among reporters not to report personal details or health problems, things of that nature? Well, two points here. I mentioned earlier that Kennedy was a bit different for the distance and the, and the wealth of his upbringing. Um, he grew up with fences around him and he kept them there. Um, <clears throat> I'm often asked if the question you just asked, you know, were you guys covering up for John Kennedy because you liked him? No. I, as a hero worshiping young reporter, uh, I spent a lot of time with the major byline guys that I had admired all my career and uh, my young career at the time, uh, and uh, closing the bar at night. Well, there are a lot of things that you hear that you can't report. They're not, they're, they're not writable because you don't know them. Mm -hmm. You can hear rumors about anybody. I've heard the same thing said about Nelson Rockefeller, that we're all kinds of rumors about Rocky and, and uh, his divorce and his mistress and all of that. But, you know, prove it. And to write a news story, you have to know for a fact that what you're writing is so. Nobody in the bar in those late night, uh, you know, unwinding sessions with the Times, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, those, the heavy hitters of, of print journalism ever mentioned the rumors. Now, one place where you can hear all the rumors is exactly there. So I concluded then and, and still believe it was covered up very effectively. Um, I once wrote that, uh, that uh, if John F. Kennedy uh, uh, knew nothing else, he knew how to have an affair and keep it quiet. Um, and also that, uh, you know, unless uh, you're at the public uh, displays, basically to have a, a story about an affair requires one of two people talking. Um, right. One hopes. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, the, 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 other, the other point that I think needs to be made here is that the society of today is totally different in its mores and attitudes than the society of 1960 or years after that. Um, you can turn on television now and get stuff that would have gotten a movie theater shut down when I was a kid. Um, and so the question that remains and can't be answered is if it had been known and had been demonstrable 
uh, that Kennedy was in, having an affair with, uh, with uh, you know, the various women who were supposedly involved, would it have been written and would it have been printed? Because uh, stuff like that didn't make it in the newspapers. Um, although I always believed and, and once wrote that, uh, that if anybody had been able to get a handle on John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe, that wouldn't have kept. <laughs> but, put Kennedy into an affair with the, uh, with the sex goddess of his era, and somehow somebody would have got a handle on that one. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower was the oldest president in American history up to this time, and, and Kennedy, in stark contrast, came into the White House full of, uh, you know, his, his charisma with his young children. Mm -hmm. Setting aside that you were a reporter for a moment, just as an American, were you swept up in the excitement of the time period? Oh, sure. Although, as I said earlier, not quite in the way that Camelot came to be recognized later on. But yeah, the contrast was so striking. You know, the torch has been passed to a new generation, uh, the inaugural speech, the, uh, and, and uh, you know, I was, I was younger, of course, than Kennedy, but it, it was my generation. Um, up until then, it was, it was uh, uh, the elders who ran the show and, uh, and everybody else towed the mark and uh, the Kennedy arrival changed that. So yes, it was an exciting, exhilarating time. Um, it was also a time of many stumbles. I mean, Kennedy's presidency was so short uh, that, uh, that some of the things that, uh, that, that uh, might not look so good in history uh, didn't come to pass. Um, the, uh, the the Paris summit in 1961 was a disaster. I mean, Khrushchev just walked in and decimated uh, the United States, and, and uh, um, you know, Kennedy was sort of getting on the job training at the time, and uh, and Khrushchev was one tough communist. Uh, later, Kennedy proved that he could be one tough Democrat, and he beat one tough communist. But right at the beginning, you know, there was a glide path. Um, so, uh, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis was uh, certainly the most striking event of the Kennedy years. And, and uh, I remember I was assigned to cover the Pentagon, and I was uh, in the middle of the night because um, I was still a uh, junior. <laughs> so I got the midnight to whatever shift. But that put me there when the first Russian ship turned back. So that's quite a story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We uh, need to talk about another big story. That was November 22nd, 1963. Here in Dallas, President Kennedy killed. You were in Washington at I the was. time. I was in the AP uh, Bureau in Washington. Take us through that weekend. I know you went to the Kennedy funeral. Walk us through your experience. I didn't actually go to the funeral. I went to, I was on the street, you know, right. as I, on, the, on Connecticut Avenue, uh, going up to, to the cathedral. Uh, my first, striking memory of, you know, aside from, my God, look what's happened, was I picked up the phone and tried to make a telephone call in Washington. You could not make a telephone call in Washington. Every line in Washington rang busy. It was locked up that way for most of that afternoon. Obviously, I'm way away from the story, except I then got sent to the White House to cover Johnson's return from Dallas. So that was my first really big piece of the the weekend's news was being the AP reporter who, uh, who reported that Lyndon Johnson had returned from Dallas as president, passed through the White House and gone over to the executive office building where his office was uh, uh, for all his rough ways. He was very sensitive about the Kennedys and Jackie Kennedy and, uh, and uh, he didn't, they didn't move into the White House for some time after uh, the assassination. And he didn't go to the Oval Office that first day, or I think the next several days. Um, a weekend like this, is this one of those moments in your career when you have to focus on being a reporter and not let any of your personal feelings or emotions get in the way? Yeah, I think that's so. Although, to me, that, uh, that uh, dichotomy was much more striking uh, when Bob Kennedy was shot, because I was much more, in, I, was, I was covering the Kennedy campaign. I was in Los Angeles. I was not at the hotel when he was shot. I was in the bureau writing the, what we call running, the continuing story of the primary election, which Kennedy won. Um, but, 
when the shooting occurred, everything changed, of course. Um, the uh, Bob Thomas, the AP uh, reporter, actually a Hollywood reporter, uh, the most venerated and senior Hollywood reporter of them all, who still is active periodically, uh, um, was at the hotel. And uh, he called and dictated a story uh, about Bobby being shot while local television, there wasn't any national television because as I say, that even then the technology was so primitive by today's standards. The television people were basically still looking at each other saying, what happened? And there was an AP story on the wire. Um, as I say, I miss the days of print. Um, I then split shifts with the guy who had been traveling with Kennedy uh, uh, up to that point. And we're, uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and it was 30 plus hours of, uh, of uh, coverage sitting in the bureau uh, um, or going by the, uh, the hospital for uh, briefings when there were briefings. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I knew Bob Kennedy a lot better than I knew John Kennedy. And uh, um, I remember, you know, your question was, how do you separate your personal feelings from your professional responsibilities? And it was, and it, it's an unconscious trait that at a certain point, as a, as a good reporter, I hope I was a good reporter, you, uh, you, you build into yourself, you, you build a wall between what you think, what your political views are, what your personal views are, and what you're writing. You write facts, you think what you want. Um, so it was a, it was it was uh, it was that way while Bobby lingered and uh, and uh, I was back at the hotel off shift when he when, when they called the briefing at which his death was announced uh, I'd already written the story and the guy who was in the bureau with the whole story used teletype tape at that time it, it ran the teletypes and I had written the story they had it in tape and he forgot to get it out and he was trying to write it. And I said, no, 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 go, go over to the right side of the desk and put the tape in, which he did. And then I ran back to you, grabbed the cab and went back to the bureau. Uh, and then I wrote, you know, about the briefing and everything that, you know, and the fact that Bob was dead. And, and uh, I had two striking experiences in that. One was uh, that uh, I never used an adjective in the story of Kennedy's death. And I don't know why. It didn't need adjectives. It was so stark and so real that you couldn't dress it up with adjectives without uh, diminishing the impact of the story. And the other was that until the plane took off with Kennedy's body in it to go back to New York, I never allowed my personal feelings to enter my emotions. And at that point, I just broke down. Because hmm. I was off duty. Going back to 1963 for a moment, how did the Kennedy assassination change the way campaigns in the future were run in terms of security, in terms of press access to the candidates, relationship with the Secret Service? Well, there certainly was more distance with the, with the security people after that. The Secret Service uh, guys who, were, who we knew well from Hyannisport all felt, to a man, felt they'd failed. Um, and some carried it with them all the rest of their lives. Um, so that, you know, there was a distance there that hadn't existed before, but the real change in, in the, the process didn't come until 1968 after Bob was shot. Mm. That's when uh, Secret Service agents were, were first assigned to, uh, to political candidates. Up until then, it was only the president who had Secret Service coverage. In fact, in 1960, um, it was, and the elections before, uh, for those of us involved in war service work, where minutes are crucial, the minute that you knew Kennedy had been sort of proclaimed president by the government of the United States was when the Secret Service agents deployed at Hyannisport. Up until then, he didn't have them. <coughs> After 68, uh, there was coverage on, on uh, any reasonably uh, um, effective president, you, you know, presidential candidate with any kind of a following and you know the distance widened and the security tightened and uh, um, so it made a marked change in the in the way campaigns were covered 
for one thing, in the, with the motorcade here, um, um, Kennedy kind of called the shots on that. You know, he wanted to be seen, he wanted to be in the convertible, he wanted to show the Texans that, uh, you know, you may, you may hate my vice president, but, uh, but I'm not afraid of you. Um, and uh, and uh, I want your votes and so forth. Um, I think uh, uh, in subsequent years, the Secret Service would have laid down the law. Mm -hmm. Presidents kind of always overrule them, but seldom do. But in that era, you know, if the president wanted to do something, uh, that's what he did. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the distance increased, the security increased, and for candidates, uh, the, uh, the government became a big player because uh, up until then, they had to provide their own security. I remember I covered Barry Goldwater's campaign for a year, and Barry's security guy was a Cadillac dealer from Nashville, New Hampshire, who we'd met early on. Um, big burly guy, looked like a security guy. That he'll do. So uh, he worked with the local cops wherever we went. Let me ask you about Goldwater, because of course the Kennedy assassination impacted the 1964 election. Goldwater told you off the record that he didn't think he had a chance against Johnson. No, he didn't. Uh, he didn't believe he was going to be elected president. He essentially he he was the only guy I ever covered who really didn't really care about being president that much. <clears throat> he wanted to run the Republican Party, and he did briefly. They took it away from him after the landslide. <laughs> but uh, but he wanted to show that the conservatives would take over, could take over the the Republican Party. And that, I always thought that once he'd been nominated, he figured his job was done. Um, was some of that apathy, you think, because he felt certain that after the assassination, the country wasn't ready for change? Well, I mean, that, as he, he said, uh, you know, look at the presidents we've had in a short period of time, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, you think they want to go to a fourth guy? I don't think he thought he had much of a chance anyhow. Mm -hmm. I think Kennedy would have beaten him. Uh, 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 Goldwater was his own worst enemy, which was great for a reporter, because he said whatever came into his head, and, uh, and we wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> We, we don't have time today to talk about every election and every candidate, but I want to ask you a couple of general questions, which I'm sure you get all the time. They're probably very cliched, but do you have a particularly favorite candidate or one that you felt was the most interesting among those you covered? Not favorite, but most interesting certainly was Richard Nixon. I mean, there were so many Richard Nixons. Uh, um, that clenched guy that I was talking about in 1960, the new Nixon who the uh, the um, um, you know, he was forever evolving and devolving, and uh, um, he was just a fascinating man to know and to cover. And he came to know your name, though, right? Oh yeah, he uh, he photographed me in his memory bank. Um, when the first time I interviewed him, I went to his law firm, and Rosemary Woods took me in to introduce me to Nixon. And Nixon, I sat down. Nixon repeated my name twice. And it was like he locked it in. And after that, he always knew who I was. Funny story, a colleague of mine covered the State Department for the AP. In those days, uh, I had a crew cut. And so did my State Department colleague. And, uh, and uh, he went on a world tour uh, with the Secretary of State and Nixon that I was not on. And you know, from Europe to Asia, he was introduced by Nixon to everybody who saw as Walter Mears because he had a crew cut. <laughs> crew cut Mears. <laughs> How did Watergate change Washington politics? Well, um, um, it certainly ran off Nixon. <laughs> um, it, uh, it, uh, it led to reforms, most of which are being eroded, if not eaten away uh, uh, steadily now. Um, I mean, Nixon, uh, Nixon, long before Watergate, Nixon was setting incredible uh, records for, for fundraising, which didn't have to be reported. Um, I wrote during that campaign, I, I, I just, uh, I mean, there was no re central reporting source. There was no Federal Elections Commission. There weren't any rules. And I wrote, I, I, I just took some time off from traveling with Nixon and 
went to a bunch of sources and I put together a story that said Nixon had raised and was spending $28 million on his campaign against Humphrey. And one of the Nixon guys saw it and the New York Times used it because they don't like to use AP stories much, but this one they didn't have. And one of the Nixon guys looked at it and said, ha, $28 million chicken feed. Turned out he spent over $40 million. Until that time, nobody had spent $15 million. Um, so the money was astronomical and you know, now it's totally out of hand. And I think sadly, the, uh, the courts and the Congress have uh, reneged on the controls that I think ought to apply. Um, you know, it's a cliche now, the court says money is speech. I don't believe that. Money is money, speech is speech. Uh, I think that there should be regulation of campaign spending and I think it ought to be rigorous. And I've often said I, I would opt for the libertarian answer. If you're not going to have any rules, fine. Raise and spend any money that you want, with one exception, with one rule, and that is it's disclosed. You raise it, it's made public immediately, how much you raised and from whom. And then if you want a president who's bought and paid for by this interest or that, you're the voters, go ahead. But now you got the worst of both possible worlds. You, uh, you won the Pulitzer in 1977 for your coverage of the 1976 presidential campaign. What was it about that campaign that set your, your coverage apart? I was often wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I found there are times in life when you don't ask any questions. I, I did ask uh, the then president of the Wall Street Journal, who was the chairman of the, of the committee that awarded the prize, because uh, I thought I'd done a better job in 1968 than I did in 1976, whether this was a prize for, uh, for you know, that particular election or, you know, from my career. He said, no, it was that election. He said, you did a great job of covering an election that nobody could decode. Because, I mean, if you think about, think back to 76, Jerry Ford had pardoned Richard Nixon, been appointed by Richard Nixon. He'd never won an election outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he's president and he's running for re-election, or election, he'd never been elected, of course. Uh, by all rights, he should have been absolutely wiped off the charts. So along came Jimmy Carter, and you know he was not a very formidable figure either. So I always thought one of the most miraculously close elections of my time was, was, uh, was that 76 election that Ford almost beat Carter. He came within two and a half points of Carter in the popular vote, there's no way he should have. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, he just had so many liabilities, but he did. One thing you might want to, I don't know if you want to get into how much more time we've got, but uh, I, do, I, I know some interesting lore about the coverage of the assassination. Uh, well, I, I want to I take a few questions from the audience. If we have time, we can maybe come back okay. to that and talk a little bit about that. But if you have uh, question cards, if you'll pass those to the end of your rows, we will uh, uh, get through as many of those as possible. I do want to ask you, towards the end of your career with the Associated Press, uh, obviously the internet began to play a more, uh, an increasingly dynamic role in, in election coverage and things like that. H how, did you, uh, how did you deal with new technology as it developed? Not well. <laughs> I mean, my, my, uh, my days of traveling uh, were carrying a portable typewriter. Um, that was my tool. Um, you had to change over to portable computers, which were primitive at the beginning, and then got more and more sophisticated. Uh, but uh, the technology is, I think, uh, uh, in some ways to the detriment of the coverage, taken over the coverage now. Things are done because they can be done. so so instantly and without thinking, without, uh, without uh, uh, you know, the typewriter, at least you had to sit down and put a piece of paper in and make your fingers work. Now you just press a button and you can tweet away anything you want. And it <laughs> produces a torrent of information and a torrent of misinformation. Well, along th those lines, let me ask you this question. Were you sorry you didn't get to cover the uh, 2008 campaign? I covered a little of it. Um, Yes, I, 2004, 2008, I covered the conventions both times. Uh, uh, I was by then writing a column and I enjoyed that. Uh, um, I was, uh, I was uh, 
always sorry that I wasn't back on the bus, but there comes a time. I mean, I remember 9-11, which was the first major U.S. crisis since 1960 that I had not uh, been involved in and eventually become the lead writer on. And I was at home. I'd retired. And I'm thinking, I should go to the office. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, they've got, you know, you retired. You turned this over to other people. And, and are they going to want you looking over their shoulder? So I didn't go, and I always regretted it. Because later they said, oh, we could have used you. I said, I wish, wish I'd known that. Here's another question. What were your impressions of George McGovern, and, and do you have a favorite McGovern recollection? Uh, George McGovern was a really sweet guy. Uh, he was a very nice man. Um, he was, uh, um, it was incredible that he was nominated in, in, as he was. Um, and uh, uh, trying to think about uh, personal recollections of McGovern, who I knew quite well. Um, he uh, um, he just was always cordial and, and, and you know there was this Midwestern niceness about him that uh, that uh, exuded uh, um, his personality. Um, One more question from the audience: What would be your advice today to a young journalist? Um, Cynically, try to find something else to do because journalism is in not great shape. Um, uh, off of my experience, uh, it was what a way to make a living. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, if, as a young journalist, if you can find a way into journalism and do it and and uh, and uh, you know make that your career, there is no higher calling in my view in a democracy, and there is no more enjoyable way. I mean, you get to go sit in the front row. Uh, you know, if you're a sports writer, you go to the World Series every year. If you're a political writer, you cover the presidential election. You know these guys. You you, you know you see it up close. Uh, and uh, at every level of journalism, it seems to me that's uh, that's so. Um, so the the challenge now is that with print journalism in decline, and with the Obviously, there's a proliferation of internet journalism, but uh, um, it's just a tough field to to uh, make a career in, uh, given the way everything is trending at this point. Uh, even you know the networks used to employ huge numbers of people; they're shrinking. Print journalism is shrinking, uh, um, and so it's a hard way to it's a hard way to go. But if you can get there, there's no better route. I put uh, pictures of two of your books on the screen here. You wrote uh, Deadlines Past, which is really your memoir of 40 years of presidential campaigns and candidates. And then you also wrote the text for a photo tribute to the Kennedy brothers. Um, both of those books, unfortunately, are out of print. We don't have them for sale today, but you can find them on Amazon and, and at other retailers. Uh, I, I have both of them on my desk, and I can tell you they're both fascinating books in their own rights and worth, worth checking out. Uh, after today's program, uh, Mr. Mears is going to be at the far back of our gallery in the little glass room there and we'll be able to answer additional questions and meet you and if you have copies of his books he'll be glad to sign those. Um, wrapping up today, if you have a, a ticket for the museum, if you haven't started your museum tour yet, I just want to tell you you have to go back downstairs to pick up your audio guide to start your tour on the sixth floor. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today but I hope you'll join me in thanking Walter Mears for being here and sharing his story with us. Thank you.